Hi guys! I thought I'd try something a little bit different today and go ahead and show a video of myself along with the sound and the PowerPoint on Screencast-O-Matic. So we've got 15 minutes together to hit the highlights because that's how long Screencast-O-Matic lets me um, talk to you so I can upload it to YouTube and then have it closed captioned for you as well. All right, so today what are we talking about? We are talking about um, administrative law. And I just wanted to mention to you that this is kind of an exciting area of law for those of you who are paralegals because there's this little known secret that um, paralegals can become hearing representatives in a lot of administrative law areas without having to go to law school. And essentially you're treated the same as an attorney. So we'll talk about that more, um, but I just wanted to let you know that because that's just a really exciting thing and you can save a ton of money going that route. Uh, law school, private law school can cost up to $200,000, so just something to think about. All right, so I will let you read your objectives on your own and we're going to get into the introduction. And administrative law is in almost everything that we do on a daily basis, it's way any type of government is run, for instance, Southwestern College um, over here, you can see um, I put our logo and we have our own rules and regulations here, so we're actually administrative law. And even when you put gasoline in your car, you've got administrative law. Um, and when you do your taxes, that's administrative law. So this is really the law that probably governs most of our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's, it's really interesting. Okay, so just rules, procedures, regulations that run different government agencies in their day-to-day -day practices. And um, I'll let you read the rest of that on your own. But I've given you a bunch of different examples we got the Department of Agriculture, Department of Commerce, which also includes patents and trademarks, Department of Defense. We're a very um, big defense town, you know, with the Navy and the Marines here in San Diego, Department of Education. Um, if you know somebody with a child that uh, has special needs, then they are going to need to do a uh, specialized education plan and that is administrative law. Okay, and there's just a gazillion of them, but I've just given you a couple slides of them so you could know what I was talking about. Um, we've got Homeland Security. We have the Department of Labor, the Treasury, and Veterans Affairs. So we'll talk about individual ones in more detail in a minute. Um, even the president's cabinet, for instance, semi-administrative. Okay, so let's scoop ahead onto this slide. And remember, you're supposed to be looking at your regular PowerPoint and really um, going through that slowly and carefully, but these videos are just really to help hit the highlights so you know what to study for your final exam. Okay, so where do these government agencies get their authority? They get it from either the U.S. Constitution, Congress, or an executive order of the president. And then they handle kind of our day-to-day -day life kind of things. So, you know, we've got the Franchise Tax Board, which is the state of California. We've got the Internal Revenue Service, was, which is federal. Um, they can be on national, state, or local levels. And we deal with them all the time. Okay, <clears throat> so each agency, administrative agency, has their own rules. So for instance, if I want to practice workers' compensation law, that would be very different than maybe practicing with the Alcoholic Beverage Board. Okay, very different rules. And even with workers' compensation law, each state has their own rules about that. So these rules are very specific to the agency and um, it's a little bit harder in some regards to get to learn the rules whereas if we have like a federal government it can be a little bit more um, across the board sometimes okay so 
these rules are very limited to just that agency. They cannot make rules that will affect another agency. And they have to stay within their own rules. They can't try to like grab power from another place. Um, where do we get some of these rules? Um, some of them are the Code of Federal Regulations. And um, I've gone ahead and done this block of uh, text that I clipped and pasted in here, but if you go to your alt text, it will read it to you if you need it to be read to you. So I just want to remind you of that feature too, and when I do pictures and things like that as well, I um, do alt text too. Okay, so if an agency is within its scope, it's made up its rules, it can enforce its rules, okay? Um, typically, you're not going to see an agency be able to put somebody in jail for a violation of its rules. It's going to be more like um, fines, especially if it's like, um, like low-level tax evasion. I mean, if it's something really egregious, then yes, they might be able to criminally prosecute but typically violating an agency's rules is going to be more like fines and injunctions and civil. Okay, one of the reasons that you could, as a paralegal, go ahead and basically practice in front of that agency is because the rules of administrative hearings are, um, they have evidentiary rules, but they're a lot more relaxed, if you will, than like state or federal court. Um, and so an experienced paralegal can become a hearing representative and then represent clients just within that one agency. So if you're thinking about law school and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I'm really interested in one area of law. Let's pick on workers' compensation for a second. I'm really interested in workers' compensation and that's what you wanna do. Think about whether you want to go to law school or not, because if that's the one area of law you want to do, you don't have to be a lawyer. You can be a hearing representative. So you have to be a paralegal typically with a bunch of experience before you can apply. Um, but you can save yourself a lot of time and money of not having to go to law school. Now, on the other hand, let's say you get sick of workers' compensation and you wanted to go practice another type of law. If you didn't have a law degree, it might be a little bit more difficult to do that. So I just kind of want to give you both sides of the coin. Okay. All right. You can read this one on your own. And I've given you a table with some more examples. These are state administrative ones. We've got the alcoholic beverage control. And um, this is called different things in different states. Sometimes we've got um, education, like we mentioned before, fish, game, and wildlife. We've got higher education, like I mentioned before, colleges, and healthcare even can be underneath this. Uh, some state pensions, workers' compensation, and unemployment compensation. Okay, another really big area, and this is federal, where a lot of paralegals go in and start working as um, hearing representatives is the Social Security Administration. And, you know, maybe at first blush this doesn't sound so exciting, but this makes such a huge people difference in people's lives. Um, my very first job in law, um, and I wasn't an attorney then, I was just um, kind of like a file clerk was working for a federal district court judge and she had me review all the social security disability claims. So people had applied for social security disability, they'd been denied by the social security administration board and then they'd appealed to a federal district court judge. And she was really busy, she, she would ask me to look these over and give her my impression and maybe write a memo on it. Um, of whether or not I, th I thought, you know, along with the law, as whether or not this would, um, should actually be approved, should be denied, and then she would read the law, she would read the memo, and she would make the decision as a judge with um, training as an attorney previously. And 
you may know somebody who's on social security disability. You may know somebody who's been denied that. And if people can't get that money, that can really, you know, just be hugely detrimental to their um, well-being. So, you know, there's just really important administrative agencies, and it's just really exciting that it just affects people's day-to-day -day life so much, and we can help them, and we can do it as an attorney, we can do it as a worker's, um, as a hearing representative. Just, I just think it's really a great opportunity. Okay, and then there's workers' compensation, and this is when a worker is injured on the job. She can, he or she pretty much has a workers' compensation case or sometimes when they can go to civil court instead but workers compensation typically pays less but it pays faster than civil um, so there's kind of some trade-offs if you will um, but it's a way that hopefully the injured worker gets medical care that's covered right away okay we already kind of talked about that slide and I do want you to read um, the cases I give you and make sure you understand them. This is a very famous case that is not from your book, um, but it's talking about psychiatric injury. And this is something a lot of people don't think of with terms of workers' compensation cases. And they might have a very hostile work environment and they might be very stressed and anxious and they might sometimes um, be able to go ahead and have a claim but it may not be a workers compensation claim but it's just important to realize that a lot of times um, if something's really hostile at work in terms of hostile work environment we don't really have the time to go into what all constitutes that a worker might have the ability to file a claim somewhere all right, <clears throat> ethics. Um, there are some law firms that are kind of known as client mills, meaning they get a ton of clients in and then they just don't have the time and the resources to really help them. And one of the areas of notoriety with this, and San Diego County at least, is um, applicant, it's called applicant and workers' compensation. You may think of it more as plaintiff. But the injured worker um, law firms, they typically don't get paid a ton per case. So there's a handful of places in San Diego that will just cram way too many clients in and then won't have the time and resources to help them out. And it's unfortunate that there's a handful of places like this and it gives, you know, more than a handful of places like this a bad name. But um, Something to be on the lookout for, but it's not so common. I think you have to be terribly worried about, but um, there you go. Okay, don't forget that I have highlighted by, you know, retyping um, your important review questions into here so that you can use them to help prepare you for the final examination. Questions, comments, concerns? please email me, telephone me, or come to office hours. All right, bye for now.